So, so business, dare I say, is is somewhat easy for me, and the, it, I, I believe so much of it comes from just growing up in chaos. When you're constantly navigating chaos, hunger, uh, abuse, neglect, all of those different aspects, the levers of business are, are kind of easy, you know, operational metrics, you know, KPIs and, and balance sheets and income statements. Well, those are kind of easy uh, compared to, OK, I don't want to get molested when I'm with my dad. So what do I do? And so I, I have found that so much of the chaos that I grew up in, I've been able to be somewhat at peace in business in decision making and my intuition and, and being able to see around corners has served me well. So, so many of those lessons have come from my very first job. Uh, when I graduated high school was – well, actually, I didn't graduate high school. I had to go to summer school to get my uh, high school diploma. I actually never graduated high school. So, But anyway, my first job after that was uh, cleaning toilets at a restaurant. And the, the irony, the name of the restaurant was called Po Folks. All the damn places I could have gone to work, and I, <laughs> I went to a place called Po Folks. And my job was from nine to three, I would clean the toilets, and I was a busboy. And I would clean the toilets from the night before, and they were horrific. And I remember standing there one day and saying to myself, okay, no matter what, if I've got to do this, my toilets are going to be the cleanest toilets in San Antonio, Texas. And that was the pride I took in, in my job. So it started standing in front of those toilets and making a decision. If I've got to clean these anyway, I want them to be the best. I, I want to be the best. Whatever I've got to do, I want to be the best at it. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. JT, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. My man, Serini, what's going on, sir? Oh, it is my pleasure to have you here. Um, you know, you and I met at Pete Vargas, Pete Vargas's uh, stage execution workshop, and I remember sitting at a table with you, and out of the corner of my eye, I caught the tagline on your website and turned to you and said, is that true? And you said, yes. And I said, okay, that's it. We have to have you as a guest on The Unmistakable Creative. <laughs> so I think I, I want to start by asking what I feel is a very fitting question given that tagline. What did your parents do for a living, and what impact did that end up having on the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Wow. So my my father was a black pimp and drug dealer in the 1970s. And, and let me clarify that because somewhere along the line, our society has turned the word pimp into a positive. Pimp my ride, pimp my house. And that's not the pimp definition that I know. My father put women on a street corner. They sold their bodies for money. And my father took every dollar that, that they made. So my father was a, a pimp and drug dealer. He had 23 children. I'm one of 23. And the most he had by one woman was three children. So that lets you know how much he got around. And my mother, she's a, she's a white woman. And she was raised in a 1950s institutional orphanage where, you know, readily and every day there was a, abuse and neglect. So – those are my parents. That's that's what I came into the world. My, my parents were never married. I have my mother's last name, McCormick, which we have no clue where that last name comes from. She was given that last name in the orphanage, but has no clue why or where it came from. So I've got this last name, but no clue where what it means or where it's from. Mm -hmm. So what was your childhood like as a, a result of this? And, uh, you know, having watched this, what impact did it have on your relationships and the decisions you made about how you would be as an adult? You know, it's it, it had many different uh, aspects. There were, you know, as, as an adult, I'll, I'll dig straight into it. As a man, as an adult, I was horrific in relationships. I did not know how to conduct myself in a relationship. I did not know how to hold a relationship. And so it had a, a brutal impact in me uh, as far as adulthood in holding relationships with, with women. I just, I was a monster. I, I was horrific in, in relationships. But at the same time, so many of the lessons that I learned from, from the hood and growing up poor and in the 
the environment that, that I grew up in, I was able to parlay and turn into a uh, business. And, and I know so many people don't want to hear this, but one of the lessons I learned early on in childhood uh, with my father being a, a drug dealer was that the money is in the comeback, meaning the the drug dealer is willing to give you the product for free up front because they know you're going to be hooked and they know you're going to keep coming back. What people don't want me to say or hear is it's very similar to a pharmaceutical rep. They go to the doctor's office. They drop off their free samples. The doctor gives out the samples. And guess what? The the patient becomes hooked and they keep coming back for, for the drug. The only difference is we as a society have chosen to make one of those drugs legal and the other one not legal. And if, if you look at it, uh, take weed, for instance. No. When I was a kid, weed was illegal. And I'll be damned. Here I am, 46 years old. And the very thing that my father said came true. Now we had league is weed is legalized in so many states. So those were the lessons I, I grew up with. My my father was a master communicator. You know, you, you have to sit back and say to yourself, it takes a certain type of uh, personality and communication uh, gift to be able to convince women to stand on a corner, sell their body and, right. and give every dollar back to you. I mean, yeah. there, there's a certain talent that, that goes into that. And, and people may not like the way I phrase that, yeah. but it's the truth. Uh-huh. Um, so you mentioned 23 kids. Uh, what happened to, to your relationship with uh, your parents over time? Is your father in your life or you know absent from your life as you were growing up? And what about your siblings? Like, do you have siblings? Are you close to them? You know, wh- what does the family dynamic of a situation like this look like? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with my mother. Um, my mother raised me single mom on welfare. Uh, we were extremely poor. I often make the joke. We were so poor. We couldn't afford the O and the R we were just Po. And, <laughs> and, and so, you know, and, and I, I like to also preface that with, we were U S poor. Cause let, let's be honest, there's a big difference in other country poor mm-hmm. and United States poor. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we grew up poor. My mother didn't learn how to drive until she was 35. So we rode the bus everywhere. And when I say ride the bus, imagine not having a washer dryer. So that means we had to pack up our clothes in in black hefty bags. We got on the bus. We stood, uh, stood at the bus stop rode to the laundromat, washed her clothes, came back, you know, rain or shine. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. So winters were brutal. Uh, if it rained, if it was hot, whatever the case may be, we, we rode the bus. So we, we were poor. You know, I, I've eaten from trash cans as a kid. When, when other kids went outside for recess, I, I hung back because I knew when I got home, there wasn't going to be anything to eat. So I, I ate food out of the trash can. Mm. Uh, my, my father um, I, I make the joke. My father was like a solar eclipse. You you rarely saw him, but when you did, it was a great moment. <laughs> and so uh, when I did see him, I, I was always excited. Every little boy is excited to see their father. But I also knew when I went with my father, it was going to be complete chaos. I knew we were going to collect from prostitutes. I knew there was a guarantee that I was going to see my father beat women. And I knew there was a high probability that I would be sexually abused by one of his, one of his prostitutes. When, when I saw him. But uh, e- even through all of that, I never told my mother what would happen when I went with my father because I knew she wouldn't let me see my father anymore. So I held it in. I dealt with it just to, to, to be able to see him. Mm. Did, you, did you understand the severity of it, uh, of what you were witnessing when you were that young? You, no, because you, you, you don't know what you don't know. C- certain things in life you you just expect is the norm, meaning, OK, if you grow up poor and you don't have money, well, then you don't know really what money is. You don't understand its value. You, you in many ways, you don't understand being poor. And, and I'll take this to the highest level. Most neurosurgeons, which is one of the highest paid uh, careers in our country, they are not good at financial planning. Why? Because they're so wrapped up in their career that 
they don't manage their their money. Many of them have poor credit. Many of them live check to check because they just blow through their money. You don't know what you don't know. So when, when I was poor, I didn't always know I was poor. And I didn't always understand that what I was seeing and what I uh, experienced was not a good thing for, for a child to, to, to go through. But um, I, I did understand that many times there was a lot of, excuse my language, horrific shit that, that went on. You know, seeing my dad beat women, uh, watching the police raid his house. It, it's just, yeah, it was complete chaos. Mm. And what about siblings? Do you have relationships with siblings? And do you know anything about these other 23 kids? Wow. So so when I left Dayton, Ohio at the age of 15, I knew I had 18 half brothers and sisters. Okay. My father passed away about a year and a half ago. And one of my half brothers that, that I actually had stayed in contact with uh, emailed me and said, hey, our, our dad passed away. So I debated. I sat back. OK, do I go back to, to my dad's funeral? I hadn't seen him in 30 years, hadn't talked to him in 30 years, hadn't been back to Dayton, Ohio. Ohio in 30 years and, and quite frankly swore that I would never go back to Dayton, Ohio, because there was nothing but negative that, that came from that city for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I ended up going back. And, and while I was there, I ended up meeting five half brothers and sisters I didn't even know I had. And so so uh, it, it's the damnedest thing. I could have walked by them on, on the street and never known they were re- related to me. So I uh, found out that my father had 23 confirmed half brothers and sisters. Uh, yeah, it, it, amazing. And I, and I will share this with you. Every yeah. now and then when I was a kid, my dad, when he pick, picked me up, sometimes he would have uh, a couple of my other half brothers with me. And so I, I had relationships with some of them. But once I left Dayton, Ohio, I had no relationship with any of uh, that side of the family whatsoever. Mm. You have kids, right? Man, I've got I've got a four year old, a three year old. The youngest just turned one. And Serene, I got another one due in November. <laughs> wow. Uh, what the two questions come from this one from you know, when you were in childhood going through all these experiences, what decisions did you make about how you would live your life as an adult? And what impact did that whole experience have on the way that you are choosing to raise your kids and be a parent? So it had a profound uh, effect, obviously. One, my father never really taught me what to do as a father. He more taught me what not to do as a father. So I want my children to always know they can depend on me. I want them to know that I will always be there for them. Those are the aspects that I did not have from my father. Uh, to, To be fair, some of the lessons that I learned from my father, I very much want to teach my children just in a different manner. And I, I'll share one of the stories with you. When my dad picked me up one weekend, we, for whatever reason, were at the grocery store and we're walking down the frozen food section. I'm about eight years old and a little girl walks by and she says, hi, Javon. Javon's my, my real name. Mm. And I didn't say anything to her. And all of a sudden I feel this blow to the back of my head. My I, I fall down. My face hits the ground. My nose starts bleeding. Then I get snatched up and I've got a forearm under my neck and I'm pinned up against the frozen food door. And my father looks at me and he says, I don't care who it is. You speak and show respect to everyone. Now I'm going to pause there. This is the man that I watch beat women and put women on a corner teaching me to say hi and be respectful to everyone. Hmm. But that lesson stuck with me. And to this day, I say hello to everyone. And in fact, I am nicer to service uh, industry uh, people than I am to most C-suite executives. C-suite executives, you got enough people kissing your ass. You don't need me to do it. Right. But, 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 but the service industry and those individuals, I'm far nicer to, to those people. But that lesson has stuck with me. Now, will I teach my kids the same way? No. Yeah. But I do want them to hold that lesson uh, near and dear because it has served me well uh, throughout. Wow. 
Um, you know, there's one other component of this that I want to talk about. Um, you and I were briefly talking about this, both being, you know, me being an immigrant and you being mixed race. Uh, it was something that I remember very distinctly in our conversation uh, when we were at the event that we met at, uh, you know, talking about feeling sort of, uh, you know, like you couldn't, you didn't feel like you belonged to a group of black people. You didn't feel on, you, you know, you felt like you feel like you belonged to a group of white people. Um, I, I'm curious, can you talk about that in more detail? Like what was that experience like and, and you know, um, what impact did that have? It was it was harsh in, in the in the seventies. You know, mi- mixed race was not uh, looked upon very well, uh, especially in the the seventies. And, and like you said, black people didn't like me because I was half white. White people didn't like me because <laughs> I was half black. So I had nowhere to fit in. Yeah. You know, and and I was called everything from uh, Oreo cookie to zebra to chocolate and vanilla swirl, and, and one of my favorites, color confused, as, as if I had a choice. And so it, it was very harsh. But I'll tell you the biggest lesson that came for me in in growing. Growing up mixed race is, you know this, most people, once they get to high school, college, or early in their professional career, they come across someone in life that doesn't like them. Mm. And when they come across that person for the first time, it rocks them. They, they're like, oh my God, why don't they like me? Is it, is, it, is it my hair? Is it my clothes? What is it about me they don't like? Well, I learned at a young age, four, five, and six, that okay, not everyone in the world is going to like me. So when I got to high school, when I got to my professional career, I just understood that as a rule that not everyone's going to like me. So I was able to just move forward and keep going. Hmm. Wow. Um, you know, so another question I have about this is, uh, you know, you came from an environment that, you know, is far from conducive to, you know, becoming a healthy and, and thriving adult. And, you know, you see two sides of this story. You know, if you watch David Letterman interview Jay-Z, uh, you hear a story of somebody who overcame his environment. When I listen to somebody like you tell me about what you've been through and now I know what you do, you overcame your environment. Why do we see the distinction between people who overcome their environment and people who don't? And if people feel even as adults, they're still victims of their environment, how do they overcome it? So I'll start with the latter part there. The the victim of your environment is – I live by a formula, Serena, and it's mindset choices and hard work equal success. And I'll start at the beginning, mindset. People ask me all the time, JT, how do you get up every day at 4 a.m.? And it, it's a mindset. I, I'm human. There are days where I want to stay in bed. You, my, my wife's laying there. I, I want to hit snooze or turn the alarm off. But then I say to myself, OK, there is someone in a hospital bed right now with cancer that's never going to leave that bed. And they would give anything just to get up and walk to the the restroom, let alone leave the hospital, just walk to the restroom on their own two feet. But they're never going to leave that bed. And I have the absolute privilege to get out of bed and go achieve all my dreams and goals. Mindset, choices. I'll admit it. Many people won't admit this, Serene. I love McDonald's. So every every day on the way to the gym, I got to pass a McDonald's to get to the gym. So I have a choice. Do I stop at McDonald's or do I go to the gym? So mindset choices and well hard work that's the easy one for me if serene if you work 24 hours i'm going 25 you go 36 i'm going 37 and for for me what has happened is that formula has equaled success so to your point of a victim and can't get past what they went through Man, the, the, the sexual sexual molestation that i went through the the harsh upbringing that i went through guess what i can't change it. There's nothing I can do. I can sit here and think about it for hours, but I can't change it. But I can change the next hour. I can change tomorrow and the next week. So I chose to just say, okay, the hell with it. What were the positives that I can take out of that chaotic background and transfer them into my life now, especially in business? And and that's what I did. Mm. Um, Let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit. Uh, and talk to me about how you get from high school to a book in the box. What were the significant inflection points? Um, what were the things that led you there? And, you know, what are the lessons from childhood that applied uh, at, at major points in your life? So so business, dare I say, is is somewhat easy for me. And the, I, I believe 
so much of it comes from just growing up in chaos. When you're constantly navigating chaos, hunger, uh, abuse, neglect, all of those different aspects, the levers of business are, are kind of easy, you know, operational metrics, you know, KPIs and, and balance sheets and income statements. Well, those are kind of easy uh, compared to, OK, I don't want to get molested when I'm with my dad. So what do I do? And so I, I have found that so much of the chaos that I grew up in, I've been able to be somewhat at peace in business in decision making and my intuition and, and being able to see around corners has served me well. So, so many of those lessons have come from my very first job uh, when I graduated high school was – well, actually, I didn't graduate high school. I had to go to summer school to get my uh, high school diploma. I actually never graduated high school. So, But anyway, my first job after that was uh, cleaning toilets at a restaurant. And the, the irony, the name of the restaurant was called Po Folks. All the damn places I could have gone to work, and I, <laughs> I went to a place called Po Folks. And my job was from nine to three, I would clean the toilets and I was a busboy. And I would clean the toilets from the night before, and they were horrific. And I remember standing there one day and saying to myself, okay, no matter what, if I've got to do this, my toilets are going to be the cleanest toilets in San Antonio, Texas. And that was the pride I took in, in my job. So it started standing in front of those toilets and making a decision. If I've got to clean these anyway, I want them to be the best. I, I want to be the best. Whatever I've got to do, I want to be the best at it. So from there, I, I went into uh, – I got a job in the mailroom at an insurance company, and that's really where my eyes were open as far as business. I got to see people in suits. I got to see how people communicate, how they shake hands, how they say hello, greet one another. And I'm big on observation. I, I just soaked in everything that was going on around me. And one story in particular, there was this fight vice president that worked there. And he every every time someone would ask him how he was doing, he would always say tremendous. And so I picked up on that. And if you notice, when you and I started our conversation, I said I was excellent. If someone ever asks me how I'm doing, I always say excellent, no matter what. Mm. My, my, it, one of my, my children could have just passed away. I'm going to tell you I'm excellent. Two reasons. One, You'll never, ever really get a read on me. And I don't want to bring any more negativity to the world. So many people are like, oh, it's, it's Monday. Oh, well, I've got this going on. Shut the hell up. Mm. I mean, did you wake up this morning? So I took that. I took shaking hands. I understood the dynamics of business, and I continued to grow throughout my career. I was 23 years old, and a gentleman gave me my first opportunity. I was a regional vice president for a payday loan company in uh, the great Northwest. And I was in Portland, Oregon. I was 23. I had no business having that, that job, but I had worked my ass off for him for nine months. And you know what? He cracked the door. I kicked it in and created an opportunity for myself. And, and let me, let me pause there too, as well, Serena. One thing that's real, um, I, I'm, I'm adamant about some people will say to me, well, JT, people gave you opportunity. No one ever gave me shit. If you hired me, you hired me because you had a role to fill. I could have easily have failed in the role and gotten fired. I created the opportunity. So if you hired me, it's because you had a need and a role to fill. You hired me with the expectation and, and the want that I was going to succeed but there were no guarantees. So anything that I ever achieved in business within a company, I created that opportunity. And many people may say, say that sounds arrogant, but damn that. I, I, I had to work hard. I had to put in the hours and, and be willing to do what others weren't to, to succeed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's interesting that you brought up being a vice president of a payday loan company where the overwhelming majority of your customers, I'm imagining, were people who were poor and probably came from circumstances like you did. Uh, yeah. What, uh, you know, what impact did that have on, on you doing that job? So at first, 
uh, had a, a great impact on me because I got to understand business. And, and I'll share a quick story with you. You, you talk about how I transferred uh, the, the lessons of chaos from growing up into business. I remember shortly after I got to Portland, maybe 30 days, the owner of the company, he, he had started with one payday loan office and now he had over 400 of them. And I remember he called me and he said, hey, uh, he was a real country guy. He goes, hell, Jovan, I want you to drive down to, to Eugene, Oregon and open up another office. Now, I was a 23 year old kid and my answer was yes, sir. And I remember hanging up the phone and saying to myself, holy shit, I have no clue how to open an office. What do I do? And I sat back and I said to myself, OK, well, first of all, I might want to find out where Eugene, Oregon is. OK, so the second, let's drive there. Third, when I got there, OK, let me look around for a space. And everything was just methodical from that point. And I thought to myself, OK, well, I've already got three of these offices. I'll make this one look just the same. And and I taught myself, you know, did I make mistakes? Hell yeah. My, my life has been full of mistakes. But I understood that, OK, step by step, let me figure this out and, and open this office. So I, I've, I've managed to teach myself uh, many of the things that that would help me be be successful in business. So, Serene, go go back to your ri- original question. Yeah, um, <clears throat> having come from the circumstances you did, and knowing that you know the overwhelming majority of customers who utilize oh, something God, like a payday yeah. loan service. I mean, what you know sort of uh, impact did that have on the way you relate to these people? Because you know, I mean, I, I think I watched a John Oliver special where he talked about how predatory some of these companies are. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. It's it's very predatory and it, it's it's sad because here here's something you really have to consider. If someone is coming in to borrow a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars. I mean, Serena, you and I have blown a hundred dollars on God knows what yeah. in, in in less than an hour in doing so. And so, but if someone's got to borrow a hundred dollars, how in the hell is that person supposed to pay it back? So it it is a vicious cycle and system that keeps people stuck and they would come in and, and I, I would tell people, you know, Hey, you can keep that payment in your pocket and you can renew and we'll start your loan over, but you don't have to make a payment. Well, if I get to keep 30 bucks in my pocket and I'm already struggling, that's like, you know, music to my ears that I get to keep this and we'll just start the loan over. But that's what it became. Keeping people trapped. Mm. One day, a white lady And a mixed child came into the office and it was at that moment I had been been in Portland for three years. And it was that moment I looked and I saw my mom and and that woman and me and that child. And literally the next day I I called the owner and said that that's it. I'm out. The game game is over because I I realized what I was doing and God, I was good at it. I loved it. It it was great. It was a a phenomenal introduction for me into into business and in all the different aspects of it. But I realized that, okay, I'm I'm just I'm part of the cycle. I'm I'm helping to keep these people trapped. And I I don't want to do that. Yeah. So how do you get from there to a book in a box and um, one, you know, what, if any, have been sort of major low points or dark periods uh, in your career after that? And how did you get out of them? 
<laughs> low point. So I got into the mortgage industry and learned everything, uh, all aspect mortgages from being a loan processor to being a loan officer to learning how to sell mortgage backed securities uh, and, and everything in between. It, it was great. I loved it. But uh, it's funny. There I was again in, a, in another industry that was kind of shady. <laughs> and so um, but once the mortgage crisis went under, uh, I said, OK, I'm, I'm not going back to that. What I what happened for me prior to that really sucked. I had blown all my money and found myself broke. All that effort I put into making money to earning commission to making some bonuses, I found myself broke. No money, dead broke, uh, sold my cars. And, and I was in a small apartment by myself, even had to borrow money from my stepdad and borrow money from my best friend to to pay my rent in, in one of the most uh, the, the lowest point for me in my adulthood is when I had to go to my change box and pull ten dollars of quarters out. And I went to stop and go in the middle of the night. And I remember walking in on the counter, I set my quarters down and I said, ten dollars on number seven, please. And good God, that was humiliating. And I'll I'll never forget that I said to myself, "Okay, I'll never be in this position again. But that was the the low point for me. Um, As far as how I got to book in a box after that. And how did you get out of the low point? uh, How did I get out of the low point? Uh, I made a, a commitment that I said, "Okay." I had already been teaching myself about investments. I had made some pretty good money in in the stock market and saved up a lot of money. And I said to myself, "Okay, I'm going to just dig myself into the the stock market, teach myself everything I possibly can. And for five years, many people don't know this. I never bought anything new, no underwear, no socks, no, no T-shirts, nothing. I put every nickel I had into the stock market and I was able to uh, make a a lot of my money back. And at one point I I had a little over a million dollars and no one knew I had that. I was still in the same apartment driving the same Mazda six car and And no one knew I had that. And so that's how I pulled myself out. I I did three things. I studied. I went to the gym and I was someone that introduced me to golf. And I used to go to the golf range and hit golf balls. And those were the three things that I did. I, I, I had minimal relationships and I was just focused on getting myself together. And it, it, the, the dark point for me as well, Serena, was I also realized that I had sucked in relationships. I, I didn't know how to keep one. I, I had treated women horribly. And it was it was that time of being broke, no money, no relationships, nothing that you sit back and you you look at yourself and you ask, who are you? And I realized that even without the money, I still had my character. And so I had hard work. I had character. And my goal was to, in many ways, re- rebuild myself. Mm. You brought up uh, two things that caught my attention. You mentioned the the gym and the golf. Um, what role did those play and why are those so important? The gym, because you can see results and it, it's structure and it's discipline. And with, with golf, it's the damnedest thing. Golf is a lot like money for me, meaning – there's a reason why they print the Forbes 400 each year because it's a scoreboard and and there's no there's no end point. You know, Jeff Bezos is now worth over a hundred billion dollars. So one day they'll they'll print an article that says Jeff Bezos is now worth two hundred billion dollars. There's no end point. What's well, the same with golf? Golf, the goal is to get the lowest score, but you never can really get the lowest score. So you're always chasing. And so much of my life has been spent chasing or really running away from my past. So you didn't know who I was. So you didn't know that I didn't have a college degree. So you didn't know that my father was a, a pimp and drug dealer or I was half white, half black. Golf became a, I identified with it very quickly, like, oh, Okay, I'm chasing this score, just like I've been chasing life my my whole life. So those two things, the gym and and golf, became very methodical to me. They they were my release. They were structure. They were discipline. And and I loved it. Mm. So how do you get from there to book in a box? 
and becoming the CEO of the company? <laughs> so, so I, uh, I, I was out of work and I started getting bored around the six month point. And to this day, I have no clue how this person found me a recruiter from a, uh, PEO, uh, professional employment organization, called me from Insperity and asked, "Would would I like to to apply?" I had never heard of the company, never heard of a PEO, so I said, "Okay, I'm bored. Why not?" So went and applied, got the job, and I was selling um, benefits, health benefits, workers' comp, payroll, uh, things of that nature. And so I got to go around and call on business owners who needed this service. So about two and a half years into it, I called up on a gentleman who owned a software company and he ended up signing on. And in about 30 days after he signed, he calls me up and he says, hey, would you like to come work for me? And I said, man, you, you run a software company. I don't know anything about a software company. I'm, I'm old. You know, that's a young man's game. And he goes, look, you don't have to. You understand sales. You understand relationship. You understand follow up. So I said, you know what? Why not? You know, he expressed to me that they had never had a sales team. And he kind of gave me the da- dynamics of the company. So when I started with him, I was employee number 13. I was the lowest paid employee. And we used to make our sales calls from a storage closet. Well, fast forward four and a half years later, uh, I got to be a part of growing the company uh, from 13 people. I became the president of the company. We grew the company to well over 100 people with offices uh, from the storage closet to offices in Austin, Dallas, Houston and Monterey, Mexico. So that's how uh, the the software game went down. and, And I learned again a lot in business. So president of a software company can't write code. Well, I was traveling a lot for the the software company and I don't like to fly. I hit turbulence one day and I thought, holy shit, if something happened to me, my kids would not know where I come from. So when I got off the plane, I set out on a mission to make sure that I could write my book for my children. So I reached out to to LinkedIn and I said, okay, who can help me write a book? It's it's Reedy, you'll appreciate this. So uh, I would give him a shout out here. Jason Dorsey made an introduction to Tucker Max, your your, your typical email introduction, uh, JT meet Tucker, Tucker meet JT. And in a separate email, Jason Dorsey emails me and he says, hey, that's the real Tucker Max. Well, I didn't know who Tucker was. Right. So 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 I email back to Jason. I go, hey, I'm the real JT McCormick. What's up? And yeah. so uh, Tucker comes over to my office at, at the um, software company. We meet in the big conference room. I said, look, I don't even know if this is a story. I don't care if I ever sell one copy. I just want to do my book for my children. And Tucker looks at me, he goes, you got to be kidding me. He goes, hell yeah, you have a, a story in a book. So we wrap up the meeting and Tucker looks at me and he says, hey man, I'm struggling with this CEO thing. Do you think you could give me some feedback on the process as you go through it? I said, yeah, why not? So unbeknown to Tucker, I was looking to transition out of the software company anyway because, one, I wasn't passionate about software. I I, I love the business aspect of it, but I don't write code. Mm -hmm. And so I get my first interaction with with Book in a Box and Tucker, and I I call him up and I said, hey, do you still want feedback? And he says, yes. I said, okay, I got this email. Let me break it down for you. And he said, go for it. I said, okay, I swing hard. And I said, this over here is good. This is great. Keep doing this over here. Why would you ever think this was going to work? This is horrible. And please stop this shit immediately. And he goes, you got all that from an email. I said, yes, sir. And he goes, would you care to sit on our advisory board? (laughs) And so I said, yeah, why not? Uh, Long story short, I kept giving him feedback. Uh, One thing led to another. I woke up one morning. I was the CEO of Book in a Box. Mm. Wow. Okay. Lots of questions come from this. Um, (laughs) What is it that enables... uh, somebody to achieve a level of performance where you go from selling in a storage closet to becoming president of a company? Like what enables success at that scale? 
Uh, for me, I've never been afraid to ask questions. If I had to t- say there was an influential teacher in my life, it was my third grade teacher. Her name was Miss Dedek. And she always said there are no stupid or dumb questions. Well, I took that shit literally. And I will ask questions for everything. Even even now, I'll sit in meetings and someone will use a word that I don't know what it means. And I'll stop the meeting. Okay. What's that mean? And so I I took that literally. And as far as how I transferred it into sales, my attitude has always been this. The worst thing you can tell me is no. And and I don't know what language I'm allowed to use here, Sereni, but I'm I'm going (laughs) to. You don't have to censor yourself. (laughs) All right. Good deal. So but, you know, the worst thing you can tell me is no. Or maybe it's a little worse. You can tell me fuck no. Okay, great. Either way. It's still a no. And for me, no just means not right now. So I'm going to call your ass back next month. Mm -hmm. So and and so many people have asked me, JT, how why does no not bother you? And I trace it back to my childhood when I would come home from school and I would ask my mother, are we going to eat dinner? And she would say no. Okay, that no hurts. You telling me, no, you're not going to do business with me and I can go call the other 999 Fortune 1000 companies until I find someone that will say yes. Fuck it. I'll keep calling. I'll find someone who's going to give me a yes. So that tenacity, that willing to do whatever it takes by any means necessary in sales, I believe had a lot to do with with me going from the storage closet to president of the company. Mm. Um, so, you know, coming from sort of a background of poverty and having amassed a, what sounds like a pretty decent amount of wealth, uh, how's your money story changed as a, as a byproduct of this? Because, you know, I remember Dan Kennedy talking about the, the difference between poverty consciousness and abundance. And I'm wondering, uh, in your own life, has that shift occurred internally as a result of all of this? Oh, totally. So, so when I would say this for people who have money, maybe you were born, born into a rich family or a wealthy family, but someone who's born into money and then loses it, I I can't imagine what that feeling is, is like, but for me, I didn't come from anything. So when I lost it all, I was fully aware of what it felt like to not have any money so that it wasn't a a new feeling. It wasn't something I had to, uh, become in touch with. I already knew what that felt like. So I knew, okay, I'm going to wash, rinse, repeat and get, get back on my feet, do this again. The second time, oh, hell yeah, I, I've learned you know, what to do, how to do it, how to keep my money. And, and not only is it how much you make, it's how much you keep. Mm. So I, I studied the, the game of money, how to structure your money, how to create a family office. What does carried interest mean? What are capital gains? All of the different aspects to how I can keep more of my money. Oh, yeah, I, I've, I've kept quite a quite a bit of it. I've done I've done very well for for myself now. Mm. What do you think causes people to struggle with money? Um <laughs> All right, Serena, let's really piss off some people. Um I have this belief that we all know this. 70% of all VC back companies fell. It's a proven fact. I'm not saying anything that's not not proven. Mm-hmm. In my opinion, VC-backed companies are a lot like lottery winners. You've you've never had that much money. So here you go and you get that much money. And what does the the majority of all uh, VC companies do? Oh, we got to move downtown to the new hotness. We got to get the building. We got to deck everything out. And they spend all this money on because they just raised Series A. Oh, my God. Well, you know what? We'll just do Series B. And what they don't realize because they've never done it, they've never had to manage money. Uh And so they're just like lottery winners where you come into this windfall of cash and you have no clue how to budget it, how to operate, how, how to do anything with it. And so where I see so many people make mistakes is when you come into cash and you've never had to budget, you've never had to bootstrap, you never had to be accountable and, and understand your cash flow. It, it's a recipe for disaster. And so athletes, lottery winners mm-hmm. and VC backed companies all have the same thing in common. 
Mm. You know, it, it's interesting you say that because I think uh, last year for the first time I was making money that was substantially more than I had in a long time uh, between you know writing books and speaking doing speaking gigs. Uh, but I also remember very distinctly from my speaking agent, he said, "Put aside fifty percent of everything you earn." He said, "Because it will slow down. There is a point at which you may have to weather a storm," and that's been this year. Um, and amazingly enough, if I hadn't done that, I would be really screwed right now. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's and and that's the the, the piece where uh, again, if you've never had to manage cash flow, you, you don't know what to do. And and this isn't a knock on athletes, but we sit back and you're like, oh my god, he made a hundred million dollars over his career. How is he broke? Well, mm. I, I'll tell you how he's broke. That individual came from the hood or a family with no money, poor, got a college scholarship that they didn't pay for. They, you know, so they, they were in college for free, still nothing to manage. And then I get drafted into whatever league and I get this signing bonus and I make the X amount of dollars over the next seven to 10 years. But along the way, I've never had to budget anything. I have no clue what to do. And I have this belief that it's just going to keep raining cash. And you wake up one day and you realize, oh, uh, of this hundred million I just made, about forty-five to fifty percent of it I've got to give to the government. So I technically only made fifty million. Oh, but I've already spent forty-five of it. So yeah, it's it, when you look back at the formula, man, it's common sense. It's not hard to figure out how these people end up broke. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I remember even uh, Mark Cuban in an interview with Chase Jarvis as an investor who <laughs> says you should avoid taking other people's money at all costs. Yes. Yes. Because one, you are now accountable to those individuals. Yeah. Now, every quarter, if I'm a VC backed company, I got to have my VC call and, and sit down and talk to a bunch of people who are not in the day to day. And I got to report to them. The beauty of us at, at Book in a Box, you know, we have no debt, no loans, no private equity, no VC money. And there's three of us. There's three owners. There's Tucker, there's Zach and there's there's myself. And so we don't answer to anyone. And so we manage our cash flow. We, we know that, OK, we have to pace our spend, our hiring, all of those aspects in, in growing a business. So we, we don't answer to anyone. And it's beautiful. Oh, and, and by the way, we're profitable. Mm, I love that. Um, so I want to go back to the education piece. And this is something that uh, has been hot on my mind because it's likely going to be the subject of my next book. Um, and it was, you know, uh, I had a post go viral title, what we should have learned in school, but never did. And having grown up, you know, the way that you did, um, having experienced what you did, what do you think we should have learned in school, but never did? Oh, Serena, you just like you set them up. I'll knock them down. Um, that is the the ultimate question for me. I cannot figure out and I'm going to take it back to the basics. So I've got a four year old daughter. Every Friday they have show and tell at school. I cannot figure out why show and tell ever goes away in school. It should be a class throughout high school. And what I mean by that is show me how to shake someone's hand how to look them in the eye and say, nice to meet you, and then tell me why it matters. Show me a wealth manager and then tell me how I can become one. Show me a job application and then tell me how to figure it, how to fill it out. So I, I'm, I don't know why there's not a class from your freshman year of high school through your senior year called Life Essentials. It, it is proven 40% of all students will never go to college. So we know that and we send these kids into the world not knowing how to what what a checking account looks like, what debt looks like, high interest credit cards, what how to shake a hand, how to walk into a, a, a job or, or an opportunity and say, excuse me, do you have any employment opportunities versus y'all hiring? No, we're not hiring you because the way you just came in here. Teach me dress code. Teach me that, you know what, in the hood, there's certain hoods that I can't go into wearing red or blue, dressed a certain way. But guess what? In business, there's certain boardrooms I can't go in unless I have on a suit and tie, unless I'm dressed, quote unquote, business casual. Teach me those lessons. Show and tell. Show me why the, the, these things are possible and then tell me how to achieve them. 
that that's that's my my rant. And, and and let me finish this up, Serini. Right now, what's really got me frustrated is there is a viral video. Anyone can go look this up. There's this teacher. He stands out in front of his class each day, and he does the 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 custom handshake. The you know dabs with his his, his students, and you know they they pound it up, and they got all these different uh, custom handshakes. And and I applaud him because he's connecting with these kids who may otherwise not have a connection with anyone. However, where's the viral video of the teacher who stands in front of his class each day, shakes each kid's hand, says, firm up your handshake, look me in the eye and teach and tell me, good morning, Mr. So-and-so. Good morning, Mrs. So-and-so. Where's that viral video? Where's that teacher that's teaching that lesson? Because the bullshit handshake and, and, and teach me to dab and all of that, I can't take that to a job interview, but I can damn sure take a, a, a firm handshake and looking someone in the eye to a job uh, interview. Mm. Wow. Um, this has been really, really, really amazing. So I have uh, one final question for you, which is how we finish all of our interviews with the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? What do I think it is that makes someone unmistakable? Uh, someone who is willing to do what others aren't. And what I mean by that is we live in a time period right now where you hear uh, the, the, the term or phrase, whatever we call it, um, work-life balance has become very popular or cliche. And, and I'm not knocking people for wanting time off with their families and things of that nature. But for me, how I became successful is or unmistakable is that I've always been willing to do what others aren't. If, if I've got to work harder than everybody else, if I've got to stay at the office till 11 p.m., I'm never going to bitch about it. And I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. And I'm going to have the belief that I can achieve any dream and goal that I have out there. And, and I'll wrap up with this, Serene. There's three words that will never come out of my mouth. Hope, wish and luck. When I was a kid and I hoped there was something to eat when I got home, it never produced anything. When I was at home and I would open the refrigerator and wish there was food in it, it never produced anything. And for all those people who say, oh, my God, the lottery winner, they're so lucky. No, they're not lucky. They bought a ticket. There's no such thing as hope, wish or luck. I have belief, which then moves me to, to execution. Mm, wow. Well, I think that makes a, a really uh, fitting end to our conversation. Uh, this has been one of my favorite conversations I've had on the show all year. Uh, so I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and uh, share all of this with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you and your work? Wow. So I've got my, my personal website, jtmccormick.com. My book you can find on Amazon. It's called I Got There, How I Overcame Racism, Poverty and Abuse to Achieve the American Dream. And of course, you can find us at bookinabox.com. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming. Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.